does the sequence 3 to the n over n factorial converge? In order to prove this, I believe it does converge, I'm going to use the monotonic sequence theorem, which states that every bounded monotonic sequence is convergent. Now, this theorem, like a lot of the theorems pertaining to sequences and series, is really a to-do list. It's your job to show that the sequence is both bounded and monotonic. Once you have those two things, then you get to say, hey, convergent. I want to say that this proof I'm about to do actually pertains to any constant here. It could be 2 to the n over n factorial, or 4 to the n, or 5 to the n. It doesn't matter. This is actually, in general, a proof that factorials grow way bigger than exponentials. More on that later. To get started on proving monotonicity, I'm going to write out some terms. a sub 1 is 3 to the 1 over 1 factorial. a sub 2, 3 to the 2 power over 2 factorial. 3 to the 3 over 3 factorial. 3 to the 4 over 4 factorial. 3 to the 5 over 5 factorial. I'm writing these out the long way so that I can see the pattern better. So first, I'm going to throw all those numbers in my calculator so I can kind of get a sense. And it kind of feels like from here on, the sequence is decreasing. And that's kind of good. Also, check it out. To get from one term to the next, it looks to me like we are multiplying by one new number every time. There's always three in the numerator, right? And what's in the denominator is equal to the index that we're on. And so what I'm going to do is make a recursive formula for the sequence. I'm going to show the pattern. And what this says is to get to the next term you're going to take the previous term and you're going to multiply it by this number and you're going to get a sub n. This is great. It's great because for any n bigger than 3 think 3 over 4, 3 over 5, 3 over 6, we know that 3 over n is going to be way less than 1. And what that means is these terms are decreasing. The next term will always be smaller than the guy that came before it. That means monotonic, monotonic decreasing. And you might be suspicious because you can see that a2 is bigger than a1 and a3 is the same as a2. But that's only the first three terms, and the first three terms don't matter. The fact is, from A3 on, this guy is decreasing, and that's good enough. Okay, so this sequence is monotonic. What about bounded? Well, if, the, if it increases to 4.5, and then it's decreasing ever after, then the highest term must be 4.5. Additionally, every single term in this sequence is positive. So the sequence uh, must be bounded, it's bounded, and so it must be convergent according to this theorem. You might be wondering why this sequence cannot be treated like a horizontal asymptote problem. Why can't you just take the limit as n goes to infinity like with easier sequences? Uh, this is the theorem that we're talking about. If the sequence can be modeled with, by a function with real numbers, if it's possible to connect the dots and make it a function of all real numbers, not just integers, then the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence is equal to the horizontal asymptote of the function. That makes certain problems in this section very, very easy. Here's the problem, though. Uh, factorials are only defined for integers. Like, there's no such thing as three-quarters factorial or, or pi factorial. There is no such thing, which means there's no such f, which means this theorem is not helpful. So there's one job left just because we're interested. We think that this sequence converges to zero, and we don't have that yet. We only knew that it was convergent. So we're actually going to get out some old school limit properties and show that this thing has a limit of exactly zero. First, what I do is I re-index. The idea here is that 
this sequence is exactly the same as this sequence. It's just that I'm renaming each of the little terms with a different index. That's not going to change the limit. That just changes the names of the little individual terms. Nobody cares about that. Next, I get out some clever algebra. I write 3 to the n plus 1 as 3 times 3 to the n. I rewrite n plus 1 factorial as n plus 1 times n factorial. Next, I know that these two limits exist and that's really important actually you couldn't skip the work that we did earlier in the video you need to know that this limit exists before getting out this limit property so I split this limit into the product of two limits this limit is a little bit easier you can tell that as n grows very large that limit is equal to zero and this limit is a little bit mysterious we know it exists but we're not sure what it is yet but hey check it out I have the original limit is equal to 0 times the original limit. The limit must be 0 because 0 times anything is equal to 0.